Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So it's a little bit of a switch up today. Today. Why is it a switch up? Because we are talking about a sequel. The squeakquel. The threequel. Talking about the Fast and the Furious Adrift in Tokyo. Oh, I was like, what? I was like, this was a sequel? Like, no. what are you talking about? <laughs> that's not what we're talking about. What are we talking about today? Adrift in Tokyo. Yeah, that's what I said, isn't it? <laughs> I swear, I, I cleaned this thing off like yesterday in wow. preparation for filming and it's already covered in fur. So this is about a, a guy owes money and another guy breaks into his house and shoves a, sh shoves a sock in his mouth, says, I'll pay you the money you need to, well, he's like, you owe, you owe money, but yeah. then he's like, but I'll pay you the money that you owe if you come walk through Tokyo with me. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't really know what else to. No, I mean, that's. That's the premise of the movie. That's about it. Guy in his dirty apartment owes money based on what the guy who, jumped, who breaks into his apartment says after shoving the sock from his foot into the man's mouth. Oh, there she is. I mean, is it spoilers if I say what happens next? Like... Uh, spoilers, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> what, like what? Well, they go on I mean, a walk together. Like... <laughs> oh, no. You just spoiled 90% of this movie with one sentence. <clears throat> I'm really upset. Yeah, and they go on a walk together. It, it's a, it, what is a, an elevator pitch? It's an, it's an elevator pitch kind of movie. You can, you can say exactly what the entire movie is about in the span of riding an elevator. Narrative-wise, it is not complex, mm -hmm. but um, I would say there are layers, but there are layers to everything, like ogres. So basically, <laughs> this movie is the DreamWorks version of Kingdom Hearts, where Shrek, it's oh, great. Oh, can you imagine Shrek in Kingdom Hearts? Bruh. The swamp? <laughs> And Donkey. And um, Donkey as the summon. And, oh my gosh. And um, Duloc. Missed opportunity. And the entire kingdom where mm -hmm. they're of all the princesses they need. I know. I know. Can you imagine? Why didn't they just go to show? Well, can you imagine a DreamWorks version where you get like the road to El Dorado and. Oh and man! B movie? Megamind? Why? Okay, DreamWorks, get on making. Kingdom Hearts game. You know, it doesn't have to make sense of it. No, I'm kidding. Do you want some Do you want some background on yes, the movie? Yes, please tell me background about this movie. So this is the fifth uh, directorial, I want to say directorial debut. <laughs> this is the fifth time he debuted. <laughs> this is the fifth movie, <laughs> the fifth film directed by Satoshi Miki. <laughs> this was released in 2007. Okay. You may be surprised to learn that his directorial debut came in 2005. Oh my gosh, so he made five movies in the span of two years? Yes. He made two in 2005, one in 2006, and this was his second in 2007. Wow. He slowed down a lot since then. But wow. prior to that, he had been a writer, uh, primarily in comedy for sketch shows and things like that on huh. television, okay. uh, for like variety shows and sketch shows. He took a lot of influence from, he said, repeatedly in different interviews, he said Monty Python was a really big influence. Oh, okay. He mostly worked in comedy. And he, in addition to drawing from, you know, particular comedians and particular Japanese directors, he more than once also said that his biggest influences, uh, his biggest inspirations in terms of comedy were non-comedic directors who used comedy in their movies. And the biggest one that he, maybe not his biggest influence, but the one that he name dropped the most was David Lynch. <laughs> Which, that, if you think about the non sequitur parts of his movies yeah. that are just like in or out of context are, are humorous, like. I could I could see influence from David Lynch in this movie. Right? Yeah. Like some of the, some of the episodes that occur yeah. are, are very just like, they, ha they, they happen apropos of nothing. They're complete non sequiturs and they don't come up again. Yeah. And yeah, and you know. a lot of the framing mm -hmm. of certain things too, like when they were walking down the street, which of course they're doing most of this movie, but then they <laughs> see the guy and they're like, oh, if you see that guy. Yes. That, the it's framing, good luck. Yeah. yeah, the framing on that shot, I felt like could be something right out of a Lynch movie. I can see that. I yeah. can totally see that. Just yeah. kind of like the, like the two people and then all of a sudden, shifting the entire mm -hmm. every everything 
I hit this every time. Every time. Every time. Every time. I abuse the flag. So, Adrift in Tokyo is the English name of this movie. Okay. The original name is Tenten, which it's oh. the Ten from Jitensha, so it's like movement. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Because it's Jitensha, it's like self movement vehicle. Yeah. Cart, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, it's movement, movement, and it's like. Um, the movement of the, movement. The word. I'll put the G Show description. It's, it's like the movement of movement. It's something like, like here and there, or like. It's like drifting around, like, you know, aimless, you okay, know. Yeah. So it was based on a book of the same name, okay. which as far as I could find has not been translated into English. But uh, Satoshi Miki, the director who also uh, wrote this adaptation, mm -hmm. said that the movie basically has nothing to do with the book. Oh. But he started working on it as an adaptation and then almost immediately added so much to it and subtracted so much from it that really only the basic premise is the same. Two people walking through Tokyo. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. like, like the entire subplot, with uh, which we'll we'll get into this once we get into spoiler territory. Yeah. But the entire subplot with the three coworkers uh -huh. trying to figure out where someone is, mm -hmm. it's completely absent from the book. He completely added that. Okay. And that's a good chunk of the movie. Like it's a whole whole ass subplot. I feel like I feel like that specific yeah that specific part of the movie really gives it depth and dimension. And I, I totally I see way. like the comedic side mm -hmm. of his influences coming in there. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can see why that was something that he put in. Yeah. Yeah. So this this was his sort of breakthrough outside of Japan. Mm. He had he obviously like he had he had done four movies in very quick succession before that. Mm -hmm. And some of those have gotten like moderate success outside of Japan, mm -hmm. but this one is probably his most well known and it's the one that's most easily available. If a comedy drama about so, with a sort of episodic structure of a, a, a loan shark and a guy who has a debt wandering around Tokyo sounds interesting to you. Uh, as of this recording, it was on uh, Tubi. Yes. I believe. It was Tubi. It was Tubi. We watched No, it, it was Asian Crush. Hopefully this is not like the last video that we did <laughs> where in between recording and, and releasing, it got taken, it got taken off. Well, some but of those streaming services cycle movies pretty quickly. They so do. They if, do. If you see this, and it is still up, um, which we'll put a link if it is. Absolutely. Um, go watch it. Yeah, check it out. Mm -hmm. So, do you want to do you want to get into the movie itself? Well, should we say what we like? I mean, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. We should probably actually, yeah. What did you think? What did you think of this movie? Well, I will say. <laughs> We did that thing that we do where we watch this movie in like four parts, I think. Yeah. And it's kind of funny. It kind of worked for the way this movie is because the movie is really episodic and you'll you'll like transition between scenes and places and things like that. And some stuff does come back up. Some stuff doesn't come back up. And I don't know, I felt like taking time off between each session that we were watching it, the parts that really stuck out to me like remained in my brain. Do you know, do you yeah. know what I mean? No, so, I, like, I absolutely understand. Because I, I, the same thing happened to me. Mm -hmm. Like the really standout parts kind of solidified more, maybe? Mm -hmm. it's, like watching, it's like watching a television show week by week instead of binging it all at once. Yeah. And then the individual moments from specific episodes stick out more. Like spark your memory. Yeah. 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 So I think it was kind of funny the way that we watched it <laughs> in just because of the structure of the movie itself. Yeah. I don't recommend watching it that way. I think like just watch the whole movie through like it's meant to be viewed, mm -hmm. but I still enjoyed it. I, I yeah. had a good time with it. I did too. I thought it was, I was laughing a lot. Yeah. I thought it was funny. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I agree uh, wholeheartedly. I liked the balance of drama and comedy. Yeah, I did too. And the poignancy that the the setup and honestly, like the maybe the first half of the movie or so don't let you know is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then there are some moments toward the end that are just like, oh, by the way, here's a, here's a philosophy on life. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, okay, I suppose that's okay. So you so you liked it, though? I did. I enjoyed it. I Honestly, I, I agree. Like, I, I picked this one specifically because it was a title that I recognized that I'd never gotten around to seeing. Because I've, I've seen this title for 
you know, more than a decade, mm -hmm. uh, brought up frequently. And it was listed as a comedy on Asian Crush. And I was like, we haven't done... I mean, I guess Ghost Squad. Ghost Squad's like a horror comedy, sort of. But I was like, you know what? I want to do. I want to do a comedy. Like a straight up comedy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I picked it pretty much exclusively for name recognition and because it was listed as a comedy. Mm -hmm. And it's it has comedic parts, but uh, it's not a hundred percent straight comedy because you're gonna feel some feels. Well, I feel like in a good way. I feel like comedies do their best when it's comedy interlaced with other emotions like i yeah. i really feel like comedy i mean it's like the whole like comedy versus tragedy how they're basically the exact same thing yeah i yeah. i think that if you can write comedy that also hits on a deeper emotional level then you're doing a really good job so i felt like it did comedy the way comedy should be done yeah other than like i don't know like I I understand the allure of like slapstick and punch in the groin kind of humor, and absolutely like I I think it's funny. <laughs> you know, like what is that show called? America's Which Funniest one? Home Videos. Oh my gosh! You know, yes. and like half of them are people just getting punched in the groin. Mm -hmm. I mean, I laugh at that. I'm not saying it's not funny. I'm just saying I think if your aim is to creatively produce comedy. Mm -hmm. Comedy in the form of like the art that you. Oh hi. Hey bud. In the form of the art that you um, are making, I think that it shows strength if you can do the comedy that also evokes other emotions. Yeah. And I'm absolutely. not saying a punch to the groin does not evoke other emotions. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> the spoiler zone. <laughs> can I can I say something first? Going into the spoiler, spoiler zone. zone? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that that balance of comedy and seriousness, uh, Miki specifically talked about that in at least one interview oh. as being the goal of not just this movie, but how he handles comedy in general. Oh, I, I mean, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Personally, I agree with that. Because he said comedic incidents, like this movie is built around just like little episodes of comedic mm -hmm. happenstances. When you interlace those with a more serious plot, like now that we're in the spoiler zone, the loan shark supposedly having killed his wife, mm -hmm. he said that when you interlace that, it really draws attention to how even when we are really going through it, mm -hmm. when we look back, our memories aren't of just this chunk of time, like this entire day or this entire week, yeah. where we felt awful because this big thing was going on. We look back and we remember all the little things. And those little things are the comedic moments. When I mean, I can see that. I don't know if my memory works that, they, that way though, because mm -hmm. I definitely think in like chunks of time. Yeah. Like, I'm like, oh yeah, senior year of high school, mm -hmm. ooh boy. Honestly, all of high school, ooh boy. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I mean, my first 20 years of life, ooh boy. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't really have anything to add to that. Yeah. I'm just talking. I just didn't want to bring that up in the non-spoiler part yeah. because I specifically had to mention the seriousness. I'm curious. To talk about I actually, I have a question for you. Yeah. Like, in, like as a segue, um, do you think this movie would be stronger if it never showed the wife laying in the bed? Absolutely. I absolutely, absolutely. think it would be. Yes. I, I knew you yeah. would. I was yeah. like, I've got to ask Eli. I yeah. have to because I was like, this movie would have so much more depth mm -hmm. if you don't actually know if he did it. Yeah. And then at the very end, when he walks by the cops, yep. and you still don't know. Yes, yeah. Uh, that, I just was like, oh. I, I, and but to still have the three who are mm -hmm. still like, where is she? Haven't yeah, heard yeah. her, but, but never show her. Right. Ah, uh, I just feel like that was such a missed opportunity. And I know, I know it doesn't explicitly show anything. I mean, for all intents and purposes, she could just be asleep. Right. You don't know. Which is what I kept expecting. I did that too. That she would like wake up or something. I, or like she will have shifted position mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. But, oh, I just, I just wanted to be like, ah, oh, get that out of here. Yeah. And this movie would be... They would take it from like A tier to S tier. I, I yes, yeah. I, like absolutely. I wish that wasn't in there. Mm -hmm. 
So it's funny. He he specifically brought that up as well. Oh, did he? Because yeah, uh, this was this was an independent film, mm -hmm. but it's, so he had a lot of control over what was happening in this movie. Mm -hmm. But I can't remember who he said it was. Um, if I, I'll, I'll find the quote. I'll put it up. I think it was the producer uh -huh. or somebody was saying. I think that that's too dark for you to include in what is ostensibly a comedy movie. Mm -hmm. And he was very specific that, no, like, this movie needs those scenes to remind you about the darkness that is happening to counterbalance the comedy. And so reading that was actually a letdown because it confirmed for me that she was dead. Uh, Which, death of the author and everything, you could still say she might not be dead. I know, but... but and that's why it was a letdown it, to, yeah, to read that. Yeah. Because I was thinking, I feel like this movie would be stronger if you didn't know. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It, yeah, like, like, From a creative standpoint, a hundred percent. We're both writers. I have a degree in English. Um, like language writing and rhetoric. Like that's like that's my degree. That's like I think about the way writing and the way words convey situations, and I feel like if you had made that ambiguous, his entire character mm -hmm. changes. And the darkness that he's mm -hmm. talking about is absolutely still there. Because if, if the man is willing to say, I killed my wife, and joke about it, yeah. that's dark. But if the man yeah. is willing to say, I killed my wife, and he actually did it, mm -hmm. that's dark. But... If you don't know either way, it could be it could go either way. It could be dark either. Like I just Schrodinger's oh. dead wife. <laughs> truly, truly, it should have yeah, been yeah. Schrodinger's dead wife. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I like that. I, I want to say it's a great movie, and I, I can't. I can't yeah. say it's a great movie because that twenty seconds. Yeah. And it's so sad to hear uh, that, that the that he like, felt he like it needed. It. Oh, that's yeah. so sad. I, to, I feel like it would be really easy for that to build upon his character, that ambiguity, mm -hmm. because we already know that he has a fake wife because oh, yeah, of the, I know. the woman with whom he went to the wedding mm -hmm. and he's been like pretending to be her husband for decades at yes. this point. Then if you're at that point, you'd be questioning, does he even have a wife? Exactly. And that's so, what makes it even more yeah. dark. If he's yeah. talking about that darkness, mm -hmm. I have a hiccup. I have hiccups. I get hiccups every single day of my life. Does that happen to anyone else? <laughs> like and subscribe. <laughs> oh, what is? Oh my! I'm gonna what, move this over. What like, do you? What do you all think? Yeah. Like, if, if you've if you've seen this and and you are, remember what we're talking about, mm -hmm. what do you think? Do you do you think that knowing that his wife actually exists and that he actually killed her contributes to the movie, or do you think that it it takes away from it? Because I think we're pretty much in agreement that it takes away from it. Wholeheartedly, a hundred percent. Now, if you think that it adds to it, that's fine. You're not wrong. No, and no, no, no. We're not wrong. Everybody can have an opinion, and it's absolutely okay. Chester's wrong. Chester's always wrong. Um, if you um, if you do think it adds, we want to hear why. Yes. Like, tell us in the comments. So I found. I also found in looking for interviews with Satoshi Miki. And like a scholarly article okay. regarding this person's take mm -hmm. on this, which is something that I never would have, I, I wouldn't have put two and two together. This could be uh, seen as a modern take on what was called a Meisho Zue, which were these like Edo era, 16 to 1800s travel guides. They were, they were travel guides that were made specifically of famous places like Edo, okay. where they're illustrated and they have descriptions of the places. Okay. And sometimes they would be even couched in like a fictionalized uh, context. Mm -hmm. Like there, there's one called that in English is called Shank's Mare, which is, oh, which yeah. I, I've read that one. Mm -hmm. it's, it's funny, it's really funny. And honestly, they were making the argument that this is similar to that because it's about two guys walking and encountering a bunch of random situations. Mm -hmm. The director brought this up in an interview that he's more interested in showing what he considers the real Japan. And in the article, they were talking about how a lot of American or like French or British movies that talked about Tokyo at that point in time, like 2000 to 2010, mm -hmm. they all focused on specific districts. 
like mm. Shibuya or Roppongi or places like that, like the big neon, you know, and they acted as though all of Tokyo is like that.、Mm-hmm. But he wanted to show the real Japan. So basically, none of this movie takes place in those types of districts. Yeah,、this、I didn't notice that. Like, it's like back. Streets, yeah, I know. Compared with、that. what we're exposed to and what we were exposed to at that time,、mm-hmm. like when we were kids, well, our conception of Tokyo was informed by basically the other part of the freaking metropolis. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Sorry, author. I don't remember your name. You're on screen. You're you're beautiful. Thank you for your work. <laughs> you're amazing. Yeah. So, do you think the kid was his son? I don't know. Okay.、Uh, I can't decide. <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. You don't think so. What do you think? I think it was his son. You think so? I do.、Hmm. I don't have a lot of evidence for that, though. I'll be honest. It's just like a feeling. I I just feel like the amount of times it came up、mm-hmm. and like the coincidences of like he said his son was dead, right? I think so. But then like I I don't exactly remember because we watched it over the course of like three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> But I do feel like while watching it, I was there. There were moments that occurred that I was like, "Ah,、oh, yeah, that is his son, isn't it?" You know. Yeah.、Um, and it was usually when they were talk when he brought things up about his dad, like the fact that his the the guy fought the the other guy with the Tommy mask、yeah, and yeah. things like that. I don't know. Like that situation made、mm-hmm. me feel like, "Oh yeah, this is his dad." I definitely, I, I absolutely understand where the feeling comes from.、Uh-huh. I think it's that my the last thing that I wanted to bring up my interpretation、uh-huh. of what was going on and sort of what I'm bringing to the table makes me think that he's not. But, okay. Well, but, I mean, go ahead and explain that. Okay.、Like. So, okay, this is obviously a very personally informed take, and if you've watched some of our most popular videos, you know why. Because I have a really personal connection to several years prior films of Shion Sono, specifically <laughs> Suicide Club and Noriko's Dinner Table.、Mm-hmm. The ending of this movie is like almost beat for beat the comedic sister project. To the ending of Noriko's dinner table. Yeah, because they they do the dinner thing、mm-hmm. and they like they're a fake family、mm-hmm. that's all hanging together, but like they're trying to make it work and they're like, but are we a real family? But are we a fake family? Um, and then at the end, one of them runs away. It's just that who runs away is different in this case because in Noriko's di- spoilers for Noriko's dinner table, um, in <laughs> Noriko's dinner table, it's The younger sister, who's like, "Bye, like I'm gonna go start my own journey," and at the end of this, it's the father figure who、mm-hmm. runs away because, well, I don't know why, because he, it, it's never resolved why he's running away instead of you know going to the police like he said he was going. Do you、through. feel like he was running away? I don't. I see. I felt like he was just moving forward. Like,、yeah. I never felt like he was running from anything. That's fair. I always felt like he was just like nomadic, basically.、Mm-hmm. Like he was. A drift in Tokyo. I do, I do, I really think so. <laughs>、yeah. I, I never felt that he was like on the run because he just、mm-hmm. lived his life. Like even with the、um, when the woman on the bike comes up behind him and、yeah. he doesn't move.、Yeah. Like I feel like that's a really big show of his character. Yeah, that he's just like, like I don't care what anyone else is gonna tell me to do. Like I'm gonna live my life the way I want to live it. I can't imagine his character running from anything. That's, Because that's even、fair. with the police, like he was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna go tell him." Like it wasn't like obviously at the end he didn't say anything. Right, but he was like, "I'm gonna take my time and then I'm gonna go to them." He wasn't saying, "I'm just gonna run from the law." Exactly, like, forever. Like he was,、right. yeah, he wasn't. Obviously, you could argue. That he is running from the law because he doesn't turn himself in, and that he is running. I I、mm-hmm. wholeheartedly see that. But because it stops right in the middle, you don't know, you don't know. if he does、mm-hmm. go and turn himself in or not. Yeah. Yeah. Because he could still walk into that building. Why don't we talk about the trio a little bit? Okay.、Um, yeah. What do What do you have to say about that? I you know I feel like some people might be like I don't understand why these people are here. There's no segue, and the fact that they like are included doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Because they don't like contribute, but they do.、Mm-hmm. Because they there's that scene where they're again the guy. If you see him, you're lucky. Yes. And then they see him. Yep. And I feel like for me that was like 
this really is all connected. Like, ev- like all of the, and it's, it kind of showed like, you know, the people in your, you are connected to people that you don't realize you're connected to. Yeah. Because he killed his wife, which I mean, has been confirmed. Like yeah. he, he killed his wife, which is unfortunate, but that we know that. Mm-hmm. But now he's also affected these three people that she worked with. Yes. You know, and that's, that's on him. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, I just, I think, I think that's just me personally, like, bringing my own take to it. Like, just the fact that your sphere of influence is larger than you perceive it to be because of the other people who are part of your life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So him, for all we know, he never even, the the loan shark didn't even know them and had never met them. Yeah. But through that one action he was having that impact on their lives mm-hmm. and, and sort of changing their course, but then they kept getting sidetracked. I know. So it didn't really. They were funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and I also think it was interesting that, like, they never discussed why the kid owed money. Mm-hmm. They never discussed where the moon shark got his money. You know, other than, like, I know he had, like, been working and then quit his job or something. That, like, I think that's what he said, yeah. But we don't know, like, but there's so much information we don't have but through these characters' interactions with themselves, with each other, and with the outside world, mm-hmm. like that being Tokyo, mm-hmm. you learn so much about them anyway. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like all the non sequiturs, like everything involving those three, mm-hmm. or like the watch shop owner <laughs> trying to fight them, or the cosplay club. Or the, yeah, all of it. I feel like all of that directly ties back into the director's philosophy about uh, drama and comedy complementing each other and sort of needing to coexist in order for either of them to work as Mm -hmm. effectively. Through through that horribleness, there can still be moments of levity. Mm -hmm. And I feel like those are where your memories, like your better memories are gonna come from. And those are the things that you should focus on more and that, I really thought that that's where the watch shop owner was coming from when he said, I want you to remember this specific time. Oh, I because see. Because he was saying, like, this is a memory that you're going to have. Mm-hmm. You know, and looking at it as a viewer, it's one of the weirdest non sequiturs in the movie. Mm-hmm. So, for, in my opinion. So it's one of the easiest things to remember. Mm-hmm. It, the movie is trying to tell us, just like the loan shark is kind of trying to tell the kid, like you need to recognize everything else that's going around in your life and not just stay in your apartment like he was in the beginning of the movie. Yeah. You need to actually recognize the world that's around you and you need to like appreciate it more. So your mindfulness, like that's literally, basically, like, basically. all of that just boils down to be mindful. Yeah. I, I kind of feel like that's the, I kind of feel like that's the point of this movie. I think when you bring up the, the thing about the watchmaker yeah. and being like the time is 8.32 or 8.30. Was it 8.32? Some, I, I think so. Or 8.33, maybe? Whatever. When he comes, when he says that, you, you know, there are like those moments in your life that you just, and you never know what moment it's going to be. No, like when it happens. When it happens, you, you have no idea. Yeah, yeah. This will be a moment that mm-hmm. 30 years from now, it will be a crystal clear memory. Yeah. And I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of you probably have that where like, it's just like this random thing that meant nothing at the time, but... For some reason, and it might not even be like emotionally attached to anything. It might not even be like really attached to anything important or big or something like that. But it's just this like solid piece of memory that is just so crystal clear. Like you could say like what the weather was like that day. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, absolutely. And why? Why did that? Why do those exist? I don't know. But why do that exist? Why does that exist? Um. Yeah, so I think that's kind of like part of what you're saying. Yeah. Like you never know when you might have one of those moments, so exactly. keep paying attention. Exactly, exactly. This movie, again, uh, as of right now, is streaming for free on Asian Crush if you haven't seen it. Uh, if, you, if you have seen it, but it's been a while, it might be worth going back to because I feel like there's so much in here that you might take something. I feel like this is the kind of movie that I'm going to watch in five or ten years and take something completely different away from it. Yep. So... Check it out. Let us know. What do you think about this movie? What's your interpretation also? Because it feel like it's so scattershot that there could be tons of other interpretations I of agree. it. I agree. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. 
And what do you think about them showing that he killed his wife? Yeah, tell us about that. I I'm, specifically want to know. I'm really curious what yeah. you think of that. Yeah. Also. Better <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good night. Uh, Good thank, morning. Thank you to Chester. Good Chester. For joining us. Everybody, make sure to pet Chester's face with your mouse cursor.